<laughs> so without further ado, Amy Miller. Thank you. Amy, do you mind if I interrupt one more time? All right. Um, yeah, so as Bob said, uh, I wear a few different hats in the nut growing world. Um, I'm a PhD student at Ohio State University. I'm based at the Worcester campus. Uh, and I also um, run or manage Route 9 Cooperative. And so when I was asked to speak today, um, I wasn't exactly sure sort of which hat to wear. Um, so what I, what I have planned uh, to talk about is, is kind of a sort of an overview of um, nut growing and especially as it relates to Northeast Ohio. Um, I'm going to talk about hazel specifically because uh, the Portage County Soil and Water Conservation District will have hazelnut seedlings for sale actually from us, from Route 9, uh, from an interesting sort of select population of wild hazels that we've selected over the last few years. And I'll kind of give you the story about those. So um, I'm going to speak about things kind of generally. Um, but I would like to, for this to be kind of informal. So if you have any specific questions along the way, feel free to ask. Or if you want to you know, hold your questions to the end, that's fine too. Um, if there's, I'm going to kind of go over things broadly. And if you would like me to go into any more detail, I can certainly do that. So um, yeah, this is sort of a loose presentation about growing nuts in Northeast Ohio, kind of what we have, and then uh, potentials for the future. So uh, to give you an idea of where we're located, uh, our farm is down here. We are, this is Carroll County, Ohio. We are um, geographically considered Northeast Ohio. We are geologically Southeast Ohio, culturally West Virginia. Uh, <laughs> we, got, we got people who live there from all over. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere and it, you know, it sort of reflects that. But anyway, um, so it took, me, it took me a little over an hour to drive here today, probably an hour, hour and 20 minutes. Um, but that's where, that's where our um, cooperative is located. And um, at the co-op, as Bob mentioned, we, we process and sell chestnuts. Uh, we sell a lot of chestnuts that we grow actually locally there in Carroll County. We also sell uh, anything that Bob can't sell locally. You know, we will process and sell through our cooperative. Um, we have sold chestnuts, bought and sold chestnuts from growers in other states, from growers in Kentucky or Pennsylvania. So it's a nice... Um, Hub, even though it's not necessarily, you know, centrally located, it's it's a nice space to be able to to process and sell nuts, either that we produce or that others produce. There's the, the shot of the co-op building. This is Route Nine, um, north of you go this way. North is Carrollton, and south is down into deeper Appalachia. Uh, this is sort of just the back end of the building during harvest season. We, we bring in chestnuts, here's some chestnut orchards, chestnut trees in the background there. We bring in nuts in these bulk bins. Uh, sometimes we use this wonderful little Willie's Jeep to help bring in the nut crop. Um, and then we sort of have a streamlined process starting on the back porch all the way until we send boxes out the other end on UPS trucks. Um, so I'm not going to go into too many details about the actual operations of our co-op, but if you'd like to know more, feel free to ask. I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. The refrigeration cell, that all takes place in that building? Yeah, so pretty much in this, this inside in this corner over here, uh, we have a large walk-in, well, drive-in cooler, um, big enough that we can operate a forklift inside. Gotcha. Thanks. I think it has the capacity to store something like 200,000 pounds of chestnuts. We've never had that many at one time, but in theory we could. <laughs> yeah. How did the people get the uh, chestnuts to you from out of state? Uh, a variety of ways, so it's just kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, usually we arrange some sort of truck to come. You know, we had, I think last year, uh, nearly 20,000 pounds come from a grower in Pennsylvania, and uh, so we send a truck over and... Is it a refrigerated truck? Or? No. Um, this, they have to get yeah, I mean, they... The, we store them in refrigeration, they do store best in refrigeration, but the nuts can handle being outside of refrigeration for some period of time. And often in, in late October, early November, it's cool enough that you know, it's not too much of a concern. Um, we did have an issue, there were some growers from Michigan who came, they brought their chestnuts to us because they wanted to use our hot water bath. We do a hot water treatment for weevils. So these growers wanted to come take advantage of the system we had set up for the hot water bath. They came with a, with a box truck, you know, hot water treated their chestnuts, put the bins back in their truck, closed up their truck, drove back to Michigan. By the time they got back to Michigan, the nuts were all cooked because they hadn't had a chance to cool. So the load was ruined. So um, anyway, these are things we've learned and considerations. But um, the, yeah, the nuts can certainly stand to not be refrigerated for a certain period of time. 
And in fact, we often will set them outside in the fall after the hot water bath to cool before we process them further. Any of your current growing uh, of, of hazelnuts and chestnuts, are you meeting the, the demand or short of it? I mean, uh, in terms of, of, of volume and everything, uh, could you do, could you actually use 100 more acres of trees or, 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 or not really? I mean, is, is demand exceeding your supply at this time? For chestnuts, certainly the okay. demand is exceeding supply, and that's the case throughout the U.S. Um, we produce, we sold approximately 100,000 pounds of chestnuts last season. Wow. Um, we could probably double that and still sell them. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the same. You talk to any group of nut growers or various cooperatives throughout, especially the eastern U.S., and they all say the same thing. There does seem to be a strong seasonality component to it. Uh, it's much easier to sell chestnuts in September and October than it is in, in November, December, uh, interestingly. So we often associate chestnuts with the holiday season, and so we think that, oh, well, you know, December ought to be a really good time to sell chestnuts. Um, you can sell chestnuts in December, but the premium price comes from the early season chestnuts. A lot of consumers perceive that the quality is much better earlier in the season. And so, you know, I could sell 200,000 pounds of chestnuts in October, but I'm not sure I could sell 200,000 pounds of chestnuts in December. Does the taste quality change if it's in storage? The, yeah, the nuts, the nuts are, they're quite biologically active in storage. Um, so you harvest them out of the field, they have a high water content, they're really, they're more starchy, and then as they sit in storage, the starches convert to sugar, so they actually get sweeter as they sit in storage. Oh. Um, but then you also have greater risk of storage pathogens, you know, molds, that sort of thing. And so, um, it, actually they do, the nuts taste better after being in storage longer, but uh, a lot of consumers perceive, you know, they, they think the quality deteriorates quite a lot as they sit in storage, which, you know, th there's some truth to that. It's not, maybe not as extreme as some people think. <laughs> yeah. On the hot water treatment, how long is it in the hot water, what temperature, and does that change the storage shelf life when you do that? Yeah, so the hot water treatment is 120 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. Um, and that 20 minute time period, basically you put in a batch of nuts into the hot water, you know, that, that temperature drops, right? So you need enough time to bring the water back up to temperature, and then the nuts need to sit at that temperature, and the, you know, the, the the temperature needs to permeate all the way through to the middle of the of the kernels, so they really only need to sit at temperature for about five minutes. But it ends up you end up needing that longer period of time to get them up to temp and then hold them for, the, for that period. Um, as far as storage, um, actually, yeah. So the the hot water treatment does um, impact the shelf life, and in fact, it improves the shelf life. We'll often put some some. Uh, you know, in our big tub of hot water, we'll put a little bit of bleach in there as well. So it's kind of a kill step for microbes and, um, you know, kind of like shines the nuts up a little bit. If there's a little dirty from the field or something, it helps. So it does improve the shelf life doing the hot water storage. Well, it actually improves the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. then what, do you, what temperature do you store them? We store them, it's uh, kind of normal refrigeration, um, what, just above freezing, what, 35 to 40? 35. Yeah, yeah, somewhere in there. Are you thoroughly drying before you put them in storage, or do you, nope. you don't? No, uh, actually for, for chestnuts, unlike other nuts, and this is really important, um, the high moisture is really important to good storage. So most nut crops, including hazels or walnuts or anything, you, know, you want to dry them sort of as quickly as possible, and they, they keep longer when they're dry. Chestnuts actually keep best when they're at full moisture. And so we store them at uh, high humidity. We, we'll, Put them in the hot water bath. We'll keep them, you know, sit them out on the porch area uh, to let them cool down to ambient temperature, and then we'll put them in cold storage, kind of at at a high moisture, and we keep the the cooler humid as well. So it's kind of tricky. There's a fine balance between, you know, keeping the moisture high and also, you know, not having a lot of like um, storage molds on the chestnuts. Right? We we don't keep them in. Um, we keep always keep them in perforated containers. Um, if we keep them in plastic bags, a lot of times they'll develop surface molds, which don't actually hurt the nut, but people don't like to look at a bag of moldy chestnuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so um, there's just some shots from the field. So we, we harvest, this is uh, our, our most mature chestnut orchard. These trees are about 50 years old. Um, we harvest almost everything by hand. And um, 
you know, they, we, we have these five-gallon buckets in the field, and then at the end of each day of harvest, we go out with one of those gray bulk bins and dump all the buckets into those bins and bring everything in by the bin. So, uh, that's the story of the chestnuts. And uh, I want to I give you the story of the hazels, because hazels are kind of a new endeavor for us. And uh, I'll kind of give you the story of these hazels that will be for sale this spring at the, at the tree sale. So, you know, if you come to Route 9 Co-op, and you're talking about chestnuts and looking around, mostly you're going to see all these big chestnut trees, you're going to see the chestnut orchards. Uh, this, this particular farm, this older farm, this is the family farm that I bought a couple years ago, called the Coleridge Farm. Um, you know, it, it, you kind of walk into this like forest of chestnut trees, but then if you keep going and walk through the chestnut trees, the, the landscape opens up and it looks a bit like this. This was all, this is all still part of the same property, but this was all strip mine land. Um, in the early 90s, this whole area was strip mined. It had been forested previously. So imagine, you know, all this open space is all forest. It all looks like this instead of like this. Um, it was forested. Uh, I'm told that some previous landowner neighbors were nut tree enthusiasts and had various types of nut trees growing in the area. Um, certainly, uh, you know, my grandfather was a nut tree enthusiast. He was the one in my family that originally bought this property and planted a bunch of different nut trees. Um, sort of, long story short, over time, the, you know, he and my dad realized that chestnuts were the best suited crop to that area, so things have become more and more chestnut and less and less other nut tree. But there's a history of a lot of nut trees being planted in this area. But when the mining came in, they stripped everything, cleared the forest, uh, mined the coal, and now, um, whatever, 30 so years later, uh, you know, th this is kind of a steep hillside here, and you can see some trees starting to regenerate. Uh, this has been a big process. We've been trying to reforest this area pretty much ever since the, the mining company left. And, um, you know, this hillside is doing okay. There's, you know, some, the big issue with reclaiming strip mine land is compaction. And a lot of trees won't grow because of compaction. Mining companies also typically would seed with some pretty aggressive grasses because the idea was they were going to turn all this mine land into, uh, into hay fields. So that was the, the value. They were going to make the land valuable by, by growing hay. And so a lot of times these strip mine lands are left with very compacted soils and very competitive grasses, both of which do a good job of preventing tree growth. Of course, the other issue we have are deer. So any, you know, any little seedlings that might start to grow in there get nibbled by the deer. So reforesting a large acreage strip mine area is, has been challenging and is still challenging in many places. Uh, so this, this little hillside is starting to come back. There are trees and shrubs, some that we planted, some that have come in naturally. You know, you get big areas like this that are um, still pretty grassy and not, not very shrubby. I, I do want to point out, this is just an interesting little side note, strip mine soils are notoriously nutrient poor. Um, and so this is kind of early spring. Um, we can see when some leaves are just starting to come out on the trees, grass is starting to grow. Uh, this grass is the same type of grass as all the surrounding grass. So I walked out there and I'm like, why is that? There's that one big clump of really tall, really green, beautiful looking grass on this poor site surrounded by all this, you know, yellow, small, short grass. And I realized that this spot is actually where we had dumped a bunch of cull chestnuts the previous year. <laughs> so the old chestnuts that we didn't want to plant, and they provided that much nutrition to the soil <laughs> and made that much noticeable difference in, in the way the grass was growing. Um, so it's just going to give you some idea of the nutrient dynamics on the, these old strip mines and also um, so, you know, one of the reasons why it's difficult to get new plants established there. Here's the same view later in the summer. And if you go up, so we looked at that, that hillside that was kind of covered in trees. This is the top of the hill. So this is a big area that was mined. And you can just see that, um, you know, there's just not a lot, not a lot of trees growing there. You know, we got some brambles starting. You know, there's some autumn olive. This is a, a patch of black locust. Uh, so the autumn olive and the black locust, these nitrogen-fixing uh, plants, can do fairly well. Um, but anyway, there's this sort of, it's just a very, you know, it's a difficult site to grow trees. So, let's take another journey. So, like, you know, walk around and check on the strip mine pretty often. I would like it to be a forest, and I would actually like to plant some of all of their nut crops there as well. So this is also uh, sort of another, from where we were looking before, if you were to turn this way, 
another angle. We have this high tension power line that kind of runs through the property. So we're gonna we're gonna take a journey. Your chestnut orchard would be like over this way. We're gonna take a journey across the strip mine down to this valley right here, in in part of this reclaimed strip mine land. And what we, what what we find are all these little these groups of shrubs that are just kind of everywhere. And it's interesting because you walk through this kind of like grass and goldenrod and autumn olive, and all of a sudden there's all these clumps of other <coughs> leaf shrubs somewhere. And I'm like, huh, what are those? And as I look closer, I realize uh, those are hazels. Those are actually all clumps of American hazels. And um, they're thick. I mean, there's a whole thicket of them. Now, this is kind of the main area where the, the population is the most dense. But these little clumps of hazels have spread out kind of throughout the strip mine area in some places where we've planted other trees and they haven't grown. And somehow, these hazels have found a way to not only colonize the strip mine land, but actually thrive there and produce a lot of nuts. Um, they're, they're very productive. And um, interestingly, so, so this, this forest here was at the edge, uh, you know, the, this was never cleared for the mining. And so the best we can theorize is that um, because there were lots of native American hazels and other trees growing before they cleared for mining, um, and because these, some neighbors had planted some different cultivars and, you know, of nut trees and, and were kind of into nut tree planting, that there were these populations of nut trees that, that used this kind of like little forest refugia, right? So after they cleared for mining, there were small populations left in these edge forest areas. And then, uh, you know, now years after mining, those populations are spreading throughout the strip mine land. And you think of the reclaimed strip mining, you think, okay, autumn olive, black locust, you know, trees that don't have a lot of food value. But then when you see hazels colonizing strip mine land just kind of on their own, uh, that's really noteworthy. And so we've been keeping an eye on these hazels and um, have been collecting nuts from them every year, have been selecting some of the, the larger, uh, tastier hazels and growing them. And so we kind of have this uh, hazel, wild hazel breeding program going on at the co-op that was started by the hazels themselves. And now that, them, that we've realized it, we've kind of tried to help it along. And so uh, we've been growing select seeds from these hazel populations in the last couple of years. Here they are. This is mid-March. And uh, I don't know if you can see very well, but th these are all the catkins. They're in bloom. Um, here's a, if you're, I don't know if how familiar you are with, with hazel flowers, but uh, this is the male flower, the catkin, and this is the female flower. It looks like a little pineapple. Uh, and they have these uh, these cute little pink styles, they're really attractive little flowers, if you can see them when they're in bloom. Um, they're wind pollinated, and actually one of the um, issues with commercial, commercial hazel production, if anyone is interested in growing commercial hazel varieties, you know, for the culinary market, um, good pollination is a challenge, especially because a lot of the hazels that we grow for culinary production are um, European varieties, and, and, or, or hybrids, and um, the timing of pollination doesn't always overlap between some of them. And so uh, one, one valuable thing I can see from this halo population is not only um, are we selecting these to kind of be maybe self-sufficient, right, their own, like have, have our own line of hazels, but also a person could plant these as pollinizers for some of their other uh, commercial hazels. And you know, not, and they're not just supplying pollen; they're supplying pollen that we think has a lot of value. Here's another shot. This is um, kind of this is where the that big group was, and there's some they're colonizing right around this pond too. So it's kind of, and the, you can, this is a hazel tree here. You can see the catkins. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is not only are these growing on the strip line, which is a degraded site, challenging for many trees, but they're also growing in. Um, fairly wet, fairly heavy soils where we wouldn't even try to plant chestnuts. We would just assume it, it wouldn't work out. So one opportunity I see here is, uh, as far as integrating our various nut production systems, is that we can we can grow hazels in areas where um, we're not going to grow chestnuts. That you know, it would just be kind of I guess scrub land, um, but we can turn it into a, we can grow a more economical crop there. This is an example of the harvest. We, we did, there's a few chestnuts in there too. <laughs> so uh, we harvested, these are all hazels in the husk um, that we harvested mid-September. So this would have been probably the first 
bucket of chestnuts we picked up. So this would have been the beginning of chestnut harvest for us. Um, and uh, and then that, that's when these hazels are, are ready. A lot of the hazels, the commercially available hazels, the, uh, the cult, hybrid cultivars, they're um, harvested in August, kind of late August. So these seem to be a bit later harvested than, than other types of hazels. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but just an observation. You know, I keep trying to pick them in August and they're still green, they're not ready yet. So mid, by mid-September for us is when they're typically ready. Um, I do pick them in the husk, so basically what we've done the last couple of years is go out with the, with the bolt bin on the wagon and just pick as many as we possibly can from our trees of interest. We'll keep some specific trees separate, like these ones in the buckets um, are ones that um, from specific trees that I want to grow, and then we'll kind of make a mix as well, ones that we're going to you know, eat, grow, play with, whatever we want to do. So um, another thing that works well in our system is that we have employees that we, that we have throughout the chestnut harvest season, and um, it's to our advantage, we sort of, we've had interns the last few years where um, we have employees who kind of live on site and they help out with the chestnut harvest. Um, and managing these hazels, you know, harvesting them, taking them out of the husks, those, those are types of tasks that those employees can do kind of in the downtime, you know, between different chestnut tasks. And so it's a nice way for us to kind of round out the work week uh, for our employees, you know. Um, for example, if someone is giving the chestnuts a hot water bath and they put the put in the bin and they gotta wait 20 minutes to take the bin out, well they can chuck hazels for the 20 minutes while they're waiting for the nuts to come out, you know. <laughs> so um, right now we do everything by hand and again this is just a small kind of new part of our industry, we're not like, you know, major hazel producers yet. Um, but we, we can manage to do this by hand because we have people there already who are kind of need things to do to fill in certain points in time. Uh, so it's a nice little synergism for us. Um, for, for larger commercial hazel industry or commercial operations, you know, a lot of it's mechanically harvested and they, they have a lot more mechanical processing. And so, you know, as the Ohio hazel industry grows, we might move more toward mechanical options and less toward hand harvest. But right now for us, this works. Yeah. Uh, now, are, are you talking about American hazel or is it all American hazel? Yeah, so that's a good question. And my answer is I'm not really sure. Uh, they are certainly, most of the characteristics seem like American hazels. They grow in a shrub-like form. Um, they do get taller. Some of the shrubs do seem taller than a lot of the other hazels I've seen sort of in the wild, like around the state. Um, some will be, you know, 15 feet tall, which is tall for a hazel shrub. Um, the, they, these sort of husk and nut characteristics are really diverse. So there are, you know, just like the proportion of husk to nut, the shape of the husk, is it open, is it closed, all these things vary widely from, from shrub to shrub with, within that population. So that makes me think that at some that they are hybrids of some sort. At some point in their history, they were hybridized. And I suspect that a previous landowner who grew had probably planted some European hazels and that, that had hybridized with wild American hazels, and then these are kind of uh, hybrid populations or back cross populations that have persisted over time. Is the nut size similar to American? Or nut size is highly variable. Some are quite tiny. Some are are larger, um, almost an acceptable sort of European commercial size. None of them are as large as the commercial European hazels. And then they also vary in their shape. So um, you know, some are more, more flat, some are more round. There's that the proportion of the the hilum, like the part that sticks into the husk and the rest of the shell, that varies quite a lot. So all the traits of these vary. So that, that's that's one reason I'm really excited about them is we obviously, there's a lot we can select for and we can kind of shift these populations in certain directions that we want because we obviously have a huge mix of genetics there. Yeah. Yeah. Are they resistant to the filbert blight or is it just an isolated pocket? That's a great question. Um, the, I have not seen any filbert blight in the population, so I don't know if that means that they're isolated or if it means they're resistant. Uh, we do have, I have planted some Turkish tree hazels for ornamental reasons nearby, and those Turkish tree hazels do have filbert blight. Um, I haven't seen it in these populations, so I can't say for sure, but as of now, so far so good. <laughs> yeah, your question. How's the deer pressure in squirrels and that? 
I would yep. think it'd be less because the land is so degraded, mm -hmm. there's less of a population. But I was just wondering if you had issues with. Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question. I'm going to go back to this this shot here. So something that I find really interesting, you know, you talk to people who grow hazels and read about growing hazels, and and the biggest complaint people have is that they can't hardly get they can't hardly harvest the crop because all the critters get to them first. And so you know, I'll go out and check on these um, throughout the summer, you know, August September as they start to ripen, and and um, I could go out there right now, and there would still be some maybe maybe not now, but you know, in December or so, a few nuts left that hadn't been eaten by the, by the critters. So it is a puzzle uh, <laughs> as to like why these don't get eaten by more things. I think certainly part of it is this kind of open landscape, right? I mean, the, the squirrels don't like getting this far from the trees. So I think there's less squirrel pressure for that reason. Um, deer, there are certainly plenty of deer around. So and the, the deer don't seem to browse these, or if they do, I think maybe another thing is if the deer do browse, because they, these shrubs are, they're growing in clumps, right? There are these clusters of sprouts that are all sort of one individual. And if the deer browses up a few sprouts here and there, the overall shrub isn't really affected that much. So I think that's an advantage of having the shrub-like growth. Um, it might also be that the deer have other things they prefer over these hazels. Um, but yeah, I have not seen a lot of browse, surprisingly. They're not protected at all. And anything else I try to grow, if it's not protected, it's going to be eaten immediately, you know? <laughs> um, so the, it is really a puzzle why these, how these are in such good shape and how they're so productive and how we are able to harvest so much despite, you know, these being kind of like out in the open and available to predators. Another thing, we did some, um, got together with some wildlife biologists who were interested in um, putting out camera traps for carnivores in the area. So we had a, we had a camera trap out here and they were taking, it was like taking pictures of carnivores that were any animals that came by. And they saw a few bobcats. And so I do think that bobcats are, are definitely, you know, feeding on the squirrels or feeding on a lot of these things that might be eating the hazels. So we get some help from bobcats in this particular site. Any questions about that? Here's a... Here's an image of some of the nuts. I was talking about the variation in characteristics. Um, you can see there's some size variation. Um, this this little this is what I was talking about, like the hilum versus the shell. You know, some some of this this is a really small proportion. Some of it's bigger. Some of them are rounder. Some of them are flatter. So we've got a quite a variety of um, of characteristics. The other interesting um, feature we have at the Chestnut Co-op, which which lends itself well to incorporating hazels, is that uh, we can dry these, you know, get, we'll just air dry them, put them in a box with some forced air. We can dry them. And we have a machine for peeling chestnuts, so we'll dry and peel chestnuts. It's basically sort of a, a giant rifle, you know, we have a big hopper, uh, and there's a big a, a tube, and a big exhaust fan on the other end. And the chestnuts will be shot through the tube, they'll hit against a, a board, the shell will break off, the shell will be sucked up and blown outside, and the nut will drop down onto a table. Um, so that was developed for chestnuts, but we found it works really well for hazels too. So um, it, we, you know, need some tweaking to optimize the process, but we could produce peeled hazel kernels using similar technology that we use for the chestnuts. And uh, this just gives you an idea of some of the, uh, this is some of the sizes, the nut sizes. So I, I sort of looked at, this, you know, used some, some buckets and holes and separated them into different sizes. Uh, the, the largest ones, the jumbo ones, are, are greater than 5 eighths inch in diameter, at that or greater. Um, those are typically the ones that I plant. I'm trying to select for larger nut size. So I've been planting those, and um, the trees that will be for sale are offspring, or the, they're, they're the jumbo size seeds. Um, and then, yeah, we have all those tiny ones that are, that are less than half an inch to be real small. So this is kind of like the range of sizes that I found in, in some of those populations. Um, so that's that's really the story of the hazels. I guess the other thing to point out is that you know I'm talking about this like it's a thing we normally do. This is this is an industry that we're developing, right? We don't have a huge um, you know a huge commercial investment in the hazels yet. This is something that I think is is something that the co-op could do a lot more in the future. And uh, if we have other growers of hazels in, in Northeast Ohio as we develop this industry, we can all work together and. Um, you know, the, the cooperative 
makes a good, you know, we already have that cooperative infrastructure in place, right? So if we have other hazel growers, uh, we can all work together to kind of grow a hazel industry in Ohio. Um, and we can also consider, you know, the, the, the current hazel industry and where most people are growing um, European hazels or hybrid hazels, they're for the confectionery chocolate market, right? And so they have very specific rules about um, size and shape of the kernels, and everything is sort of specialized and geared toward the confectionery industry. Um, I think, and a lot of people I talk to think that there are lots more potentials for hazels beyond just, you know, I mean, they're delicious to chocolate, so don't get me wrong, but, uh, but there's a lot more we can do with that. And so as we collectively grow more hazels, um, we also need to be creative about uh, marketing strategies and uses for these hazels, and uh, I think I think sort of together as a as a fledgling industry, we can tap into some new markets and create some really fantastic hazel products. Could you create a generic Nutella? Yes, I don't see why not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is that the uh, full growth of it? Is it going to stay bush form or is it going to grow up to be a tree? Or? Yeah, so those ones, um, th these ones that, that I'm currently growing are going to always be shrub form. So they're, they're multi-stemmed, like, you know, you can see this pink flag, this indicates that this is like one cluster. So all of these stems are part of the same shrub. And so, and this one, you know, I'm, I'm standing kind of level with this. So you can see that they're taller than me. Um, not a lot taller than me, but somewhat taller than me. I know that's not saying much. But <laughs> um, yeah, th this is about the maximum height that they'll get. I don't know if they were... Now, I, I'm, I'm growing all of these on reclaimed strip mine land. If you were to put this on actual good fertile soil, you might see different results. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so it, it, they may get taller on a better site. And in fact, they would probably get taller on a better site. Another advantage to these being small in this particular site is you can see they're right under this high tension power line. And there's a rule about those power lines, they can't be any vegetation over 15 feet tall under there. So actually I can get away with growing the hazels under the power line because they're short. If they were the more tree form European style hazels, they would be too tall for that site. Um, so this is actually a way I can use this ground under the, um, under the power lines. Yeah. Are you picking the hazels off of the, the shrub itself or off, picking them up off the ground? Off the shrub itself. And that's another, another advantage to the shrub-like form, that they're not very tall. You know, I can, I can go out with a few friends and we can stand there with, I just use like an apple picking basket. We can stand there and just pick off hazels and do it in the apple picking basket pretty easily um, without. And this is pretty rough terrain out here, so it's not very conducive to using a ladder or, you know, uh, like some sort of um, lift. Uh, so the fact that they are short and we can just pick them off, off the tree for, while we're sitting on the ground is another advantage to this particular system. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about, I mean, I may be preaching to the choir here, but some of the, just the benefits of growing nut trees in general, you know, why, why we should consider nut production in our area um, and maybe why we need to move more toward nut production and less toward the conventional row crops. Yay! <laughs> yeah, this being the Soil Water Conservation District, <laughs> you probably see stuff like this all the time and it's just probably horrifying to you. <laughs> so this is a neighbor's uh, soybean field. And remember, this is Carroll County, it's very steep, steep hills. Um, you know, this is a poorly managed soybean field, lots of erosion. Uh, we see this all the time, and um, this is, you know, this is really not helping anybody with anything, right? There's not good soybean production happening. Uh, there's loss of, of soil resources. Um, you know, this, this is this is a degraded landscape. I mean, the strip mine was it was a hugely degrading event, uh, but this is something that's continuously degrading the landscape year after year, rather than building soil nutrition and, and building the types of soils that can support lots of life and lots of food. And so th this type of system, because it degrades the soil every year, then requires a huge amount of external inputs to, to keep the system going. It's not perpetual, it's not self-sustaining. Um, so yeah, you can get away with it for a while, but in the long run, uh, not a great idea. So you know, we've got these, these bean fields or row crops that are high disturbance, annual crop, uh, no soil integrity, 
low biodiversity, uh, low resilience. The only advantage, I guess, would be a quick recovery from disaster. You have a big flood event, the bean field washes away, well, you just plant the bean field the next year. You know, not, not a huge deal. If you have a, a nut tree-based, you know, perennial agricultural system, um, and this is a chestnut orchard, you have high soil integrity, high biodiversity, high resilience against environmental fluctuations. Uh, but the big downside is there's little or no recovery from crop disaster. So if you have kind of these, you know, major events like a, a huge disease outbreak or a major flood event or something where your big trees die, well, it takes a long time to recover from that, right? So, um, so in the in the long run, sort of you're you're building a much healthier ecosystem and you're building a, a more self-sustaining ecosystem in this type of system. Um, when we grow our chestnuts, we we use very little inputs. You know, we'll often during tree establishment, we'll apply some fertilizer. Uh, you know, do some weed control, those types of things. Then this 50-year-old chestnut orchard, uh, we do almost nothing. Um, we control for chestnut <coughs> eagles. We mow a few times a year, and uh, then we harvest the chestnuts. So, you know, once you get this type of system established, it's self-sustaining, and there's so much other vegetation growing in this chestnut orchard that that gives you an indication of the quality of the soil. This also, all this other vegetation in the trees hosts a diversity of organisms, so we have a whole eco ecosystem going on um, where we don't have a lot of um, pest and disease issues, where a lot of pest and disease issues that we might have kind of take care of themselves because we have these biological systems in place. Now there are some critical chestnut related pest and disease that we still have to manage, but for the most part, that's a very healthy, sustainable system. Are those American chestnuts as well? Those are Chinese chestnuts. So most of the, the culinary nut production are Chinese chestnuts. Um, they are resistant to chestnut blight. So we, and, and they also produce larger nut size. Most of our consumers <coughs> want the Chinese chestnuts. I actually, um, Lynn, I have no idea like what time it is, so I don't know how I'm doing on time. <laughs> Does anybody um, know? <laughs> 10 to 11. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. If uh, I mean, I, we can we can stop no, at any time. Everybody's so. awake. <laughs> okay. Let's kind of keep going. All right. <laughs> standpoint, we can achieve maybe like a steady state ecosystem. So when we study ecology, we learn about succession. You know, there's, a, there's an open field, sort of certain plants come in first, animals come in, and then over time those populations change and this ecosystem changes until it reaches some sort of hypothetical, theoretical, steady state system where it kind of like perpetuates itself and, and the rate of change is slower. And so when we have something like a mature chestnut orchard, it's in this sort of like steady state ecosystem phase. You know, we, we manage it slightly, but for the most part it kind of perpetuates itself and it can do that for uh, hundred, you know, several hundred years probably. Um, in some parts of the world, like especially in uh, Italy, the Mediterranean areas where they, where they have European chestnuts, um, they have 500, 800 year old trees that have been kind of creating these chestnut forests. For, for hundreds of years, and they're managed very little. People go harvest nuts, so so it's possible to maintain this type of agricultural system that is feeding humans and providing habitat for wildlife and providing all these different types of ecosystem services um, for you know theoretically hundreds of years if it's if it's set up right. Uh, yeah, so these so these trees are not only providing food; they're providing uh, fuel. We burn a lot of chestnut firewood. Um, you know, they're participating in carbon sequestration. They're building soil communities, soil integrity, and biodiversity, um, which contributes to overall organism health, nutrient cycling, air purification, and water quality. Those are two issues that we are very concerned about, especially in the Appalachian part of Ohio, where not only do we have water quality issues from coal mining, but now we have air quality issues from fracking. So, you know, any, any of these types of, you know, biological systems that can improve our soil and water and air uh, are, are needed. 
So here's just a little story of uh, this is this is the Coal Ridge Farm uh, from another side. The strip mine I showed you before is kind of like back behind this hill. This is this is uh, an area where we've got some young chestnut trees, and um, we have this. This is all reclaimed strip mine land as well. You can see that it's diverse. You know, we have a lot of different types of annual plants there, um, and uh, you know, appreciate the, the diversity there. And uh, we've been slowly working on planting a variety of fruit and nut trees in this area to, you know kind of produce more and different, different types of food per acre. This is what it looks like, I guess I should say. This was five years ago, maybe. This is what it looks like currently. Uh, so this is young, the young chestnut orchard here. Um, and then this, this whole area here is where I have a, a mixture of fruits and nuts, mostly apples. I'm really interested in growing apples, especially for um, cider production and you know, maybe get into hard cider someday, but um, yeah, so... You this, just get better by the minute. <laughs> 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 so this is kind of the, the play, like my, my playground, you know, we, we have this, uh, you know, th thanks to sort of the generations that have come before me, we have this chestnut production system that's fairly well established and ticking along, and you know, we, we just need some minor uh, management every year. So I, that gives me a bit of time and energy to play with new things. So this is my playground where I'm looking at various uh, low input growing systems for fruits and nuts, especially apples. Apples are kind of my main focus in this area at the moment. It's, you can kind of see some trellises there. Um, anyway, but I think you know the development of these kind of low input agricultural perennial agricultural systems are crucial to our um, to our food supply, to our human health. And, and you know, to our ecosystem resilience. Oh boy, that's not really fitting on the page. Why is that? All right, so I'll just uh. Maybe to project. Uh, yeah, I sort of had some. <laughs> anyway, she I'll just. Has all the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so if, if you want to grow pretty much anything, but I think especially fruit and nut trees, you know, I always kind of refer to what I call the prosperity triangle, uh, and that is environment, um, economics, and production. So, you know, production is, can you grow it reliably, and, and you know, can it sustain, can you grow it sustainably for a long period of time? Economics, can you afford to grow it, is there a market for it? And then the environmental component, which is often, um, you know, absent from thoughts in the annual agricultural systems, you know, getting the right crop for the right site so that that crop can, can grow there happily for many years. Um, you know, ask yourself, are you exploiting or creating ecosystem services? You know, in that example I gave of the soybean field on the other side of the hill from our chestnut orchard, you know, we've got um, soybean field is exploiting the ecosystem services and requires lots of inputs, whereas the chestnut orchard is actually creating ecosystem services and is actually enriching land that was degraded as opposed to continuously degrading the land. And longevity of the lifestyle. So, um, yeah, so I'm a third generation chestnut grower, and um, I'm able to do that basically because um, because these production systems and these, these agricultural systems are set up in such a way that they can uh, not only you know make money and support the family, but also kind of maintain themselves over long periods of time. So, um, you know, anybody interested in nut growing recognizes that that, that these are long lived systems. And uh, often these are multi-generational endeavors. If you get things set up right, then someone will be interested in doing it after after you're gone. You know, um, my you know my grandfather yeah, he grew chestnuts as well nut trees in general as a hobby. Um, but turns out he grew some really nice chestnut trees, and it's because he had this this orchard, these nice trees that were had lots of production, that kind of led my dad to say, hmm, maybe we could do something about this. And so he expanded the orchard, created the actual business aspect of the of the chestnut of orchard, and um, kind of like set things up to the point where I said, "Huh, you know what? Maybe I can actually, you know, do this as a living." Um, so because because these things have been set up for longevity, you know, that allows people who are interested to to find it and remain interested. So I'm going to go through some. Um, these are, so these are some slides I borrowed from a, a chestnut talk. So the, the next couple of slides are going to be chestnut focused, but you can extrapolate these ideas to other nut crops as well, not just chestnuts. So what do you need to be a successful nut grower? 
Um, so you need to have the right kind of personality. Basically, uh, someone who's a bit pioneering, enjoys unknown surprises and discovery. If you want someone to tell you a formula, okay, this is exactly how you're going to grow this and this is exactly how you're going to make money. Nut growing in Ohio is probably not for you. You know, go to California, they have a little more power, a little more precisely there. Uh, however, I think the imprecision of the nut industry is actually what leads to a lot of the um, sustainability. So, um, you know, figuring out which types of trees are right for which types of sites, figuring out diverse marketing opportunities, you know, these are all things that um, are kind of fun to do, but also kind of like build resilience into the industry. You know, if you're the California pistachio industry and everything is one cultivar of pistachios and then, a, a, you know, an insect pest or disease, fungal disease comes along and kills all of your pistachios, you've got nothing to fall back on, you know. Whereas if you're a nut grower in Ohio and you have part of a diverse landscape and you have a more ecosystem focused approach to the way you grow nut trees, um, certainly there can be devastating diseases that come in, but if there are, your system is already built to kind of, you know, you can make adjustments easily without totally starting over, I guess is the thing. Um, you know, if you have, uh, you know, for example, we lost some chestnut trees to oak oil recently. And with oak oil, it's a devastating disease because it kills the entire tree, right? You've got you know, 30, 50 year old trees that are in full production that are just dead in a season, right? So that can be really devastating and you know, kind of like, can be kind of scary. But if you have that chestnut orchard, and you have some hazels, and you have some walnuts, and you have some hickories, kind of this mosaic of production, you know, you lose 30 chestnut trees, your overall business model isn't in, as in danger. Um, yeah, I think we touched on some of the other stuff. So the, uh, you know, transgenerational. Uh, so one thing that really helps with starting in the in any type of nut industry is having some non non farm income. I think anybody who farms knows that. Um, you know, like I'm I'm in a very fortunate position where you know I'm stepping into a nut a, a nut farm nut industry that's already rolling, that's already in place. And so, you know, I can take advantage of that by working for the co-op, and that gives me kind of the time and energy and financial resources to play with some of these other nut production systems that, that I'm talking about. And so, um, you know, having, having the, either having an established nut farm in place or having off-farm income can help you explore new possibilities, and that's really how the industry develops. You know, my, my grandfather never made a dime from growing chestnuts, um, yet because of his... Uh, his hobby and his efforts and his off-farm financial resources, then the next several generations have been able to make money from growing business. So, you know, you got to think about these things temporally as well. Cooperative and sharing, that's a huge thing. Um, anybody who's in here is involved with the Ohio Nut Growers or the Northern Nut Growers can tell you that we all benefit from sharing information with each other. And, um, you know, a lot of times people who try to think they're really onto something and keep it a secret fall behind. And uh, those of us who share information freely, you know, it's like the rising tide raises all ships, you know. And because this is such a, nut growing is such a multi-generational, long-term type of thing, we need to pool as many resources as we can to learn as much as we can, you know. I don't, I don't have enough time in my life to make all the mistakes and learn from them, but if I have a bunch of friends who are also making different mistakes and learning from them, then we can all kind of learn together and uh, improve the, the systems that much faster. So uh, the right site, and again, this, these characteristics are, this is the right site for chestnuts. Um, I do want to, uh, when it comes to other nut trees, I do want to mention that, um, well, I guess, let me, let me back up a little bit. In general, whatever you're going to grow, you want to make sure that it makes biological sense to grow it there, right? There, there are some, some hard edges on, uh, you know, between the, the biology of the plant you're going to grow and the site. So it's really important to be aware of that. Uh, chestnuts in particular are really site, are really picky about the site. You can grow chestnuts very easily with you know, minimal effort if you have a good site. Um, if you have a poor site, you can pour a lot of time, effort, and resources into those trees, and they're not going to do very well. So actually recognizing the biology of the plant and putting it in an appropriate site is important. However, on the other side of that coin, um, there's 
a lot of latitude, especially when it comes to other nut crops like hazels, for example, they can, they can handle a wide range of soil and environmental conditions. So they're much more adaptable to, to more diverse environments than chestnut trees. Um, same can be true with walnuts. You know, walnuts are kind of interesting where a walnut tree will grow almost anywhere. Um, now, if you want the, you know, the saw log veneer, if you want like kind of the best uh, you know, walnut tree for, for timber, then you're going to want to plant that tree on a really good site because they're, they're very responsive to site. You know, you plant a walnut seed on an ideal site, it'll just kind of on its own grow into this beautiful tree. You plant the best cultivar or walnut cultivar you have on an off-site, it's going to disappoint you. So that's another, another case where like the site is important. Um, but a lot of times people will get discouraged if they don't have the quote ideal site. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've heard some old uh, chestnut grower curmudgeons, you know, talking about people growing chestnuts, they'll say something like, you know, why are they trying to grow chestnuts in Vermont? You know, chestnuts are best suited to kind of the south, to, you know, the chestnut industry should be based in, like, Missouri and Arkansas. We'll say something like that. And they're like, okay, well, um, but by that logic, we shouldn't be growing them in Ohio either, yet we are, and look, we're doing it, some, you know, most successfully. So, just because, um, a site is not objectively ideal in every way for your nut crop doesn't mean that you can't actually have a successful industry there. You know, look at, for example, uh, you know, the Ohio wine industry, right? Like, well, wine grapes aren't very well adapted to Ohio, yet we, we, have a, we have a wine industry, right? There are people who successfully do that. So, you know, keep in mind that site selection and biology of the tree is important, but also don't be fully discouraged if somebody says, your site's not perfect, and you can't do that here. Yeah. I have some kind of a chestnut growing below uh, hemlock and spruce. I get little teeny nuts. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I'm thinking about maybe moving them out to the sun. I you mentioned that, or a, a few of them. But would that explain the small kind of nut that you maybe the sun or maybe is it a um, is it a chinka pin? So there's a little the chestnuts that the species that produce they produce like a cluster of burrs typically, and there's like one nut per burr. Is that, what you're, is that what you have? I'm finding on the ground just one. Okay. So oh, you're finding them on the ground. Yeah. Well, then maybe, yeah. Um, yeah, if you if you can collect those nuts and put them in like a sunnier spot, I'm sure they'd be happier. Yeah, there's um, a bunch of seedlings, so it seems to be thriving in, in this wood, uh, shaded area. Yeah. That's, that's another interesting thing about chestnuts. That, you know, say like, okay, the, they need full sun. Um, another bit of nuance in, in site selection or, or any, any aspect of of growing trees for fruit and nut production is that a lot of times trees will grow in a wide range of conditions than their fruits will grow, right? Like you can grow, you might be able to grow a chestnut tree in the shade just fine, but you're not really going to get a lot of nuts off of it compared to a tree that's in full sun. Um, but that's, uh, apples are notorious for this. It's really easy to grow apple trees. It's challenging to grow apples. You know, so just because the trees will tolerate a wide range of conditions doesn't mean that you'll get the product that you necessarily want. So yeah, if you had your chestnut trees growing in the whole sun, you would probably get much more nut production. But as, but as you notice, the trees will grow, so they will kind of sustain themselves in a more shaded area or like a quote off-site. More questions about that? The soil, you said uh, deep, you have deep in the parentheses. Mm -hmm. Well drained deep, or you need it to be acidic at a low level, too? Um, sort of both. So, so again, these are, these are the ideal conditions to, to grow chestnuts. So if you have well drained, deep acidic soil, um, chestnuts will thrive. Uh, low, like the, uh, chestnuts won't tolerate a high water table. So if you get, so then that's why the, the deep aspect is important. Um, and it's okay if the soil is rocky. Most trees don't mind rocks in the soil. Um, but the, a high water table will be detrimental to, actually to most nut crops. There are a few exceptions. But for the most part, generically speaking, well-drained, you know, loamy soil is good for most nut trees. So, so it can grow on flooded uh, land, but it's just not going to produce good nuts. Chestnuts won't. They'll, they'll, they won't survive on them. If, if, if they have a high water table, they'll get root diseases and, you know, roots, they won't have enough root growth to support the tree and they'll die. Um, there are other trees that will kind of like 
survive on, <laughs> on uh, soil with a high water table, but they won't be productive. Um, I think walnuts are, walnuts are a great example because a lot of you know, people, they're, they're recognized as a, a floodplain species, and so people think, oh, I'll plant them near creeks or kind of near wet areas. Um, and every walnut planting I've seen where people have planted them in areas with a high water table, the trees are growing, they're surviving, they might even be producing walnuts, uh, but they don't look healthy, you know, and they certainly don't look, uh, they don't have saw log qualities. So if you're trying to grow them for wood characteristics, you know, they're crooked and branchy and, and struggling. So, um, so yeah, that, that high water table can really impact quite a lot of things. Are there sensitivities for any of the nut crops that you're growing to um, herbicides? So, in thinking in the context of an agricultural and an alley crop and agroforestry sort of mm -hmm. scenarios, do they uh, require special care either during the establishment or in order to harvest mm -hmm. nuts protection from herbicides? Do you have some sort of large buffer area in which there's no yeah, that's a good question. So the um, during establishment of young trees, uh, <coughs> so we've done it several ways, and there's lots of schools of thought on this, and you know, you can go on the internet and find people with all kinds of opinions. But uh, so in establishment of young trees, you know, we have especially in areas like the the reclaimed mine land where there are really strong competitive grasses, we have gone through the year previous to planting and use Roundup or some sort of life state product to just make openings. Uh, and then we've come in later and planted. Um, now I have seen, uh, or I've been part of, unfortunately, chestnut planting where young trees were planted, somebody came in and used uh, Roundup around the trees. They're like, oh, but I didn't touch the trees, you know? And those trees suffered greatly. You could see when they, when they leafed out the next spring, the leaves were small and curled and there were a lot of dead areas in the leaves. And the, and the trees were slow to start because of that residual damage from the Roundup. Because um, they guess what? Just because he didn't touch the trunk of the tree with the Roundup doesn't mean it didn't get into the roots. And Roundup in particular, um, let's say you use it in the summer or the fall, it can actually be very impactful on the growth of the tree that next spring. So I advise people to avoid Roundup near your trees. Just don't do it. Um, there are other options. Now, one thing that we do in these like really grassy areas when we're establishing young orchards, we'll we use like a grass-specific herbicide, things like fusillate or clepidem, um, you know, that we can spray on, on newly grown grass, like four to six inch grass uh, in the spring. We'll do one application just right around the tree to kind of like open up some areas around the tree. That does not seem to hurt the woody vegetation whatsoever, it, or, or any broadleaf vegetation. It's very specific to grasses. So uh, something like that, that's very specific herbicide, seems to be, you know, it, it can be very helpful to establishing your planting um, and not hurt the trees. But you're not seeing such sensitivity that uh, your neighbor or your field next door spraying the, you know, typical conventional management of those fields mm -hmm. is impacting. So if you have a little bit of distance, you, it's safe to attempt to establish you know, with, your, with your neighbors or other fields. We're still, you know, conventionally managing the life phase. Yeah, it's um, drift is, is certainly an still issue. An issue. Yeah, it, yeah, it's certainly an issue. I know of several people who have had, um, maybe not the whole tree loss. Some have had whole tree losses, but some have just certainly had production being impacted by drift from a neighbor's field. Um, I think probably, you know, if you have the space and the means, the best thing you can do is put in some sort of buffer, uh, yeah. like fence line, tree line. Yeah. You know, something just to physically block the drift, um, you know, white pines or something like that. And so, yeah, other than that, I mean, if your neighbor's spraying, there's not much really you can do other than try to <laughs> mitigate what you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got a question, Amy. You know, we're talking, most of your folks is on, on production sales, but if we're a hobbyist, we want to grow, let's say, a couple dozen hazelnuts or a couple dozen chestnuts. How do we get started? <laughs> yeah, good question. So the... Um, well, the, I'll say one cool thing about having a resource like the co-op, like Rotline Co-op, is if you are a hobbyist, a backyard grower, and you know you grow a bunch of hazels and they're really successful in your yard and you got more than you can eat, hey, guess what? We'll buy them off you and resell them. So the co-op does provide a way 
for you to be a hobbyist or a commercial grower, you know, in the same season. Um, as far as getting started, I would say one of the most important things you can do before you do anything, and you will agree with me, is a soil test. <coughs> you need to know what your soil parameters are before you get started. That will help you um, choose the right crop to begin with. And then uh, if you need to make amendments, either chemical or biological, then you can do that to get yourself off on the right foot. I think a lot of people waste quite a lot of time and resources, you know, by like, plant first, got to ask questions later. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's important to take the time to do the background research, test your soil, look at what vegetation is already there, pay attention to, you know, how water moves across your land and how water tables might fluctuate. And that, taking the time to do that will save you time in the long run when establishing your crop, even if it's yeah, as a backyard hobbyist. Um, but yeah, soil tests. I would say soil tests, and then uh, you know there are resources like soil and water offices and um, you know county extension services that can help you. Once you have your soil test, they can look at that with you and say, okay, based on this, here's what we advise. Or hey, you should talk to the nut growers about what type of nut trees are best here. That sort of thing. Yeah. What pH range is good for hazels, and what did, what kind of pH range do you have on that reclaimed land also? Hazels can tolerate quite a range. Uh, they can thrive in the same acidic conditions as chestnuts, or they can uh, grow in soils of you know pH up to you know seven. I think I've seen them in seven. Never seen them in higher. Um, but uh, on the strip line, the pH is all over the place. It's 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 a really amazing. I did some uh, soil sampling, just kind of like in a grid system, and looked at the pH of the soil. Uh, at, at various layers in the soil and then at various points and the pH ranged from you know like 4.2 to 7.5 mm -hmm. within an area as big as this room you know like hole to hole where different trees were planted is, is drastically different so um, so yeah the uh, I haven't tested the pH specifically where those hazels those that that biggest clump of hazels are growing um, but they you know based on what I've seen based on the literature they can tolerate a, a very wide range of pH. How are we doing on time? <laughs> I could talk all day or stop any time. So. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I guess this, this kind of goes along with the site. So this is a young chestnut orchard. Uh, this whole area was planted in chestnuts. And you can see this is kind of a low swale, high water table area. So the chestnut trees that were planted there didn't survive. This is just kind of some brushy, like, you know, blackberry, bramble type stuff in there. Um, but, you know, if I saw something like this, you know, on, on the site that I'm interested in, I might say, okay, this is obviously not a, a suitable chestnut site, but I would try some of my hazels in there, maybe some elderberries, um, you know, uh, pawpaws, something. I, I would I would kind of play around with what can I grow in that swale. So obviously it's not a good chestnut site, but but there's something something that will do well there. Let's see what else. Uh, right trees. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, I guess the main point to say is that uh, if whatever nut trees you're growing, again before you start, whether whether you're a commercial grower or a hobbyist. It, it pays to spend the time to do the background research, talk to people, you know, read what you can, try to figure out what trees are right for your situation. Because um, again, it's like back to the whole ideal site thing. You know, someone might say, well, if you want, you know, maximum production or whatever, this is, you know, buy these grafted trees of this cultivar and they'll tell you exactly what you need to do. But you might not need to do that for your location. Um, you know, we found in the chestnut industry that most of our production comes from seedling trees and, and we currently we prefer <coughs> to grow chestnut seedlings over grafted trees which is really unusual for a commercial crop um, and so you know in our in, in this case both in the commercial industry and in the hobbyist industry seedling trees are best um, if you just want kind of like low maintenance production um, when it comes to other things like uh, like hazel so the hazels that, that I keep talking about uh, those are seedlings, right? So they're going to have a lot of individual variation. Each one will be a little different. Um, and, you know, if, if that doesn't matter to you, then fine. You know, if you're, if you're uh, let's say, for example, growing hazels just to eat yourself or to, uh, you know, let's say we're going to, like, dry and peel these and sell the fresh hazel kernels, 
Um, maybe it doesn't matter if we have variation in size and shape, you know. But if you're trying to grow, you know, four Ferrero Rocher chocolates, then you want to make sure that you're growing grafted trees of a certain cultivar that meet certain specifications, you know. So um, <coughs> choosing the right tree just really depends on your goals, and you know, it, just because some, you know, uh, celebrity on the internet says you need to buy this this type of tree for this purpose doesn't mean that isn't necessarily the best thing for your operation. So definitely take some time to talk to people and do, do some research on this. Um, orchard inputs, you know, these are kind of standard across a lot of, uh, you know, if you're going to any type of trees, you need to do a lot of these types of things. You know, deer protection is really important. Um, like I said, there's the anomaly of the hazels on the strip line that seem to the deer don't seem to eat them, don't know why, but for anything else, deer protection is really important. And that's also very important if you're going to be a backyard grower, you know, putting a few trees. I mean, it doesn't matter where you are, I'm sure uh, all of you, anybody who's trying to grow something in your yard <laughs> has, has seen the damage deer can do. <laughs> um, all of these other inputs, these, you know, uh, say maybe like weed control, mowing, fertilizer, irrigation, um, these all can depend quite a lot on your end goals. And, and I will say that there is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all recommendation for those things. Um, there are lots of different approaches you can take depending on the risk, your, you know, your, the, the size of your operation, your resource availability, the environment in which you're trying to grow these things. Um, and so, this, again, there's something where it's really important to figure out what your goals are, what your site is like, and then adjust accordingly so that you're kind of optimizing, you know, you're, you're um, putting in like some sort of like the least effort for the most gain for your particular location and your particular goals. Pest and disease control, again, there's kind of a lot of, uh, you know, that also depends quite a lot on where you are. There are, you know, things like, like weevils. If you're going to grow nut trees of any kind, for every nut there is a weevil. <laughs> and, and the weevils are everywhere. Um, so, you know, if, if you want to get into any type of nut production and you want to have commercially viable nut kernels, uh, you're going to need to learn about the biology of the particular weevil that affects your particular crop and you're not going to figure out what to do about it. Uh, that's, just, that's just the life of, you know, these nut trees and weevils have very intimate associations. The good news is that weevils tend to be very specific to certain nut trees. So if you have a big infestation of chestnut weevils, they're not going to affect your hazels and vice versa. Um, this actually might, you know, might support the idea of kind of like intercropping or polyculture where you're having, you know, several different types of trees in sort of a mosaic where you're spreading out <coughs> trees of the same kind. Uh, it might alleviate some of the pest and disease pressure. Now there are all, there are handling uh, issues with that and other other issues, but from a pest and disease pressure standpoint, actually spreading trees out and intercropping different types of trees together can be very beneficial. Do the hazels have a weevil? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a hazel weevil. Do, does a hot bath work on those, or is that just a chestnut thing? Uh, I so a hot bath would work on it. The the, the big question that we have to I, I don't know that anyone has done this. So the the hot bath for the chestnut. We discovered that that specific temperature is really important because uh, it kills the weevil, but the actual quality of the nut is not affected, and the nut itself is still alive, right? So you can take a chestnut that's been in a hot water bath, and it will grow, um, but, but the weevil dies. And so that specific temperature, uh, we know that for chestnut, um, we'd have to verify whether or not that same temperature works for other types of nuts. That I don't know. Um, with young trees with the hazels, my struggle in the last couple of years was infestation of the Japanese beetles. Yeah. You know, foil. So yeah. I, the, um, the, the American um, filbert that you're using, are you having any trouble with those when you're at? The Japanese, yeah, Japanese beetles are, they're such generalists and they seem, these infestations seem to be, you know, a bit unpredictable. You know, some years there are just crazy infestations. Like I remember last summer, we had really bad Japanese beetles like on everything. Um, you know, and then some years eh, you don't really see them as much. So um, they, they will, they will infest hazels. 
I really haven't seen much that they won't touch, <laughs> given the opportunity. Um, I think having having a, a diverse amount of plants, like if, if you just have hazels, they're going to eat your hazels. <laughs> you know, if you have hazels in a, a kind of a mosaic of different things, um, you know, they won't necessarily just eat your hazels. Uh, it seems once they get established, they you know, a big tree, it doesn't bother them. If you right. just have a little five-year-old tree, they're just there. I, exactly, yeah, yeah. Unless but, you put something on. Yeah, yeah, so. continue to put it on. You know, I don't know if there's so, like a silver bullet for the Japanese beetles. There, it, there are um, uh, biological controls for chestnut weevils that attack the weevils while they're in the ground. Weevils overwinter, chestnut weevils overwinter in the ground. Mm -hmm. They crawl out of the nut, they go underground, they live as grubs for, for about two years until they emerge as adults. And uh, there are treatments, nematodes and fungi that uh, will attack those larvae in the ground. And I'm pretty sure that those treatments are not specific to, to weevil larvae. So if you have Japanese beetle larvae in the ground, those could be effective against them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there are some, some nematodes in particular that are effective against Japanese beetles. So that might be worth looking into, especially if you have a small kind of like a backyard area that you can you can reasonably treat, you know, with a, with a, like a nematode application. Mm -hmm. That might help you quite a lot. Thank you. Have you had any uh, problem on your uh, hazelnuts with uh, snake bugs yet? They're there. I see them there. Um, I haven't really noticed. I've, I've noticed on the hazelnuts, it almost looks like when I open the hazelnut, it looks like blossom and rot. Oh, from where they they puncture them. Yep. I have not seen that actually. Are are you growing um are you growing European or hybrid hazels or are you growing American hazels? European. Hazels? Yeah. So okay. one difference is with the European hazels, the husk is open, and I think those stink bugs can access them better. With most of the American hazels, the husk is closed, so it's hard. There are some insects that get in there, but I think the stink bugs if they I don't think they can actually access the nut before before you harvest it. Well, they the, they'll they go into my heart nut so. I haven't seen that. I mean, I've definitely seen stink bugs around. I haven't seen them as like a big, like a big problem, like an honor problem. Um, but that's good to know. <laughs> um, it might be just my pocket. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You might have like, a little stink bug central there. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. That's a good question. I'll, I'll look into that. I'm curious. But uh, yeah, I don't have experience with that. I think we're pretty much going to wrap it up. I don't think that's, <laughs> um, I don't know if, you know, oh, there's, there's push harvest. I talked about post harvest a bit. There's some chestnut flower. So, you know, when we're talking about growing any of these nut crops, you know, we focus a lot on fresh market, but we also have the ability in the co-op to do processed products. So that's something um, collectively we can think about and develop over time uh, for various nut crops and processed products. Amy, I collected uh, all my chestnuts this year and put them on, in the refrigerator. Well, they all dried out. I didn't know I was supposed to keep them moist. Okay. And they're still in the refrigerator. Can they be made into flour now, or have they, mm -hmm. once they've turned hard as a rock, are they? Oh, if you want them hard as a rock to make them into flour. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah we, we dry them completely before we okay. grind flour. Yeah, so any, any moisture. Uh, Water is the enemy of the flour mill. <laughs> so if, if you if you try to grind moist chestnuts in, in a flour mill, it will turn to blue <laughs> and be a disaster. So yeah, if they're hard as a rock, then yes, you can make them into flour. Check check to make sure they're not moldy. A lot of times if they draw in the fridge like that, you open them up, they might poof, might get some like, you know, those green molds and stuff inside. So check them first because you don't want that in your flour. Right. <laughs> Have you started to uh, plant to the point the hazels to figure out if, what your spacing should be and getting into that a bit more? Yeah, so I um, I have been planting, and this is just, you know, get a few years to see if I still agree with this, but my current thought, uh, I plant on a, a 30 by 30 spacing, and then I basically mow grids to keep each cluster kind of in its space. So I, I end up with these kind of like like checks like a checkerboard, you know, in, in my hazel orchard because um, I'm, I'm letting them be uh, shrubs with lots of sprouts. So I'm not trying to train them into a single tree, and I just use I just kind of mow, you know, in a grid pattern to keep everybody in their space. Okay. Do you so think you have to go that that large, and you could be more intense in the number of plants you're putting in 
Yeah, you could go smaller. I guess I chose that because of the size of our mower. Okay. So we have any equipment. So it's all based on <laughs> yeah, 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 it's based on the equipment. <laughs> so if sure. you have smaller equipment, then yes, you can do smaller spacing. Uh, so yeah, you know, I guess just kind of scale it to whatever size of uh, land and I didn't know about any efficiency return. How much land you use? Uh, not, not yet. Okay. Ask me in a few years. Thank you. <laughs> Do you mow under your chestnut trees when it comes harvest season? Because I noticed you had a lot of growth under there. Yeah, so that that was those pictures were with all the vegetation. That was midsummer. So we do mow. Uh, we mow twice a year. I think Bob maybe mows more. Again, there's different schools of thought on this too. But we mow like in August, and we'll just kind of knock down all the tall vegetation. And then right before harvest, like early to mid-September, we'll mow again, and that orchard will have like a golf course finish. So it goes from being a jungle, you know, uh, with weeds bigger than me, you know, in the middle of the summer, to like a golf course lawn um, and when it comes harvest time. Do you rate that off too? Nope, we leave it. Uh, and that's that's part, part of the, the thought process is that we're basically, instead of applying fertilizer, we're just kind of recycling those nutrients within the orchard. And um, we find after, we usually apply fertilizer to trees at, at the beginning of establishment. We have a lot of orchards that we haven't fertilized in years. They don't need it, you know, um, kind of, because there is some sort of nutrient cycling that happens. Yeah. I was going to ask, just related to that, so do you use a flail mower or mm -hmm. a flail yeah. mower? And are you intentionally growing cover crops for, for legumes and things like that for to offset fertilization? Um, so we, at the Carroll County Orchards, uh, we, whenever we make a new planting, we always seed with Timothy. But we find that's a, a nice, uh, as, a, as a grass, uh, it's not competitive like some of the, you know, um, you know uh, bluegrass and fescue and some of those. And Timothy will also, based on our mowing regime, it goes to seed every year right before we mow. And so it will kind of reseed itself. So we've, we've found that Timothy and chestnuts play well together. Um, and I mean, over time, a lot of other stuff comes in. It's, we don't necessarily maintain just the Timothy orchard lawn. Uh, I helped put in a planting at Worcester at a, in an old um, hay field, which you know had a hard pan layer and some it just you know had was not really good soil for trees. Um, there, we planted a cover crop mix of um, what was it? We did red clover, oh Timothy red clover, and tillage radishes. And uh, we weren't able to get in off to the site before planting with a, with a ripper to kind of rip up that hard pan mechanically. And so I wanted to include those tillage radishes to help break up the hard pan. Um, if, I will say, so as far as like native plants go, I used to hate pokeberry. I don't know why, but it was like one of those things that was instilled in me as a child. Like, this is a weed, make it go away. <laughs> um, now I actually really like pokeberry. As a as a component or as a helper plant in orchard establishment, if you've ever seen pokeberry roots, they are huge. They tiny. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people will go through a lot of efforts to grow tillage radishes or beans or things to, to break up the soil. If you just do nothing and, and provide perches for birds, pokeberries will come into your site and they will perform that same <laughs> service of loosening up the soil for very little effort on your part. <laughs> you know? So I, I have stopped trying to annihilate them as I, as I used to. You know? Do you ever pasture animals under the, in the orchards? I know with the federal regulation, I think it's, you have to move the animals out six months before you harvest the nuts. But some nuts, if they're normally cooked before eating, you can run them. Like pecans, they'll run cows in mm -hmm. right until they're ready to harvest the nuts. Yeah. Since you do that hot water bath, does that count as a sterilization procedure to where you could pasture, you know, sheep or something in there? So we've never specifically looked into that regarding those rules. We've just kind of like avoided the issue altogether. But I think I think you could make the case. I mean, chestnuts are commonly consumed, cooked, and there is kind of that kill step in between. So I think if you really wanted to kind of push it, you could probably make that case. Um, we, we have never done that. Um, we just basically, we've never had anybody involved in the co-op who's really interested in pasturing animals and has really like figured, figured out those systems. Now this year for the first time after harvest, uh, we had a, in a couple of our orchards, we had really heavy weevil infestation, poor weevil control. At one point we decided, 
all right, it's just not worth it to, for us to harvest these nuts. So there's a certain percentage of the nuts that just got left in the orchard. Um, there was a local pig farmer who contacted me and wanted to buy cold chestnuts from us to feed his pigs. I said, hey, how about this? How about you just bring the pigs to the orchard? They can clean up all those nuts that were left on the orchard floor. Oh, by the way, that will probably help with our weevil infestation because with all the rooting around and, and disturbance that pigs do, um, they'll collapse a lot of those chambers that the weevils live in in the ground. Um, so we, we had pigs in the orchard for about a month after harvest this year in one of our orchards. I'll be really curious to see next spring and next harvest season if there's any noticeable impact of those pigs in the orchard. But that was the first time that we had actually captured animals in the orchard, and it was after harvest. Do you also spray for the weevils or do you just do the hot bath? We spray for them, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll spray a couple times a year, late summer. The weevils, uh, they lay eggs right, kind of right toward the end of, of the nut development. So kind of like late August, early September is when they're typically active in laying eggs. And so we'll spray at that time of year. Um, we just have a big air blast sprayer. I think a helicopter or drone spraying would actually be better for large trees. Um, but. You know, we have an air blast sprayer on the back of the tractor that we use. That's the only thing we spray for, really, at least at the moment. But if we don't, if we don't spray for the weevils, I mean, these weevils are. It, you can go from like zero to a full infestation in a very short amount of time. <laughs> they, they are they are really tricky to control, and they can the population can grow by order of magnitude every year if, if, without good control. Does refrigeration do anything to? <coughs> To kill the weevil? Not at all. They still pop up. Oh, they don't mind it a bit. <laughs> it's really interesting. We've actually had nuts with weevil, with weevil larvae in them, submerged in water in the cooler for months. You can bring them out of the cooler, and there's a little weevil larvae in the, in the bottom of the bucket. Dump the bucket out, and those worms will start wiggling. Mm. They, yeah. <laughs> they, they seem to be able to handle it. <laughs> Now, if you have nut submerged in water at warmer temperatures and uh, you kind of let them sit for about a week to nine days, this is sort of ancient Italian technology, um, the water will get gross. It'll, it'll kind of, there's like some fermentation that happens, you know, from the natural microorganisms in the nuts. And if it's, a, if it's kind of warm, like 65 to 75 degrees, and it sits there for a week, that seems to kill the weevils. So they're, I think because of the lack of oxygen and the microbial activity, that will kill the weevils. But if you could have put them in cold storage where there's no respiration, no microbial activity, and there's lots of oxygen in that cold water, they will die. Uh, you have one on one of your slides about mycorrhiza. Is there any particular strain that's good for hazels or um, chestnuts in particular, or just any mycorrhiza? I think any like any of the like most of the formulations you can buy to inoculate with are there's a mix of species in them. Uh, one thing about mycorrhizae is they will find your plants. <laughs> you know, if, if you don't even if you don't inoculate at planting time, they will come. Um, so some some people say don't even bother trying to inoculate because they'll come on their own, which is true. And I wonder if you can get a little head start if you inoculate. Uh, but as far as like particular species. But I don't know a lot. I know that um, chestnuts and white pines share several mycorrhizal species. So in areas where we have cleared white pines and planted chestnuts, those trees do way better, way faster than trees that were that follow other land uses. 